Ladies and gentlemen, friends, old and new, first a very warm welcome to Liverpool Hope. I'm Dr Ian Vanderwall, I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor, I look after operations and I also head up the business school. And it's my pleasure to say a few words uh, to open proceedings this evening. I'd like to start by thanking our sponsors, uh, Stephen Burroughs and John Kennedy. We're extremely grateful uh, for their generosity in supporting this event and uh, uh, for uh, the business school to be hosting this event. The days are shortening and the uh, November weather uh, is really atrocious out there, so I'm all the more delighted to see so many of you uh, here this evening taking time to join us in what I feel will be an interesting and inspirational lecture. And it's nice to see, too, uh, lots of our students with us as well. I'm sure you're all familiar with Timpson's shoe repair and key cutting business, which was founded by William Timpson, a shoemaker, in 1865. Over the years, they developed into one of the most respected high street brands, having been in the top 10 of the Sunday Times 100 best companies to work for every time they've entered it. The company's philosophy was summed up by James's father, who is noted to having said, if you treat people well, it's blindingly obvious they'll do a good job. And this then becomes the business driver inherent in the DNA in the company. And so it's my pleasure to introduce James Timpson, OBE, and Chief Executive Officer of Timpson Retail. On Twitter, he describes himself as a cobbler, prison recruiter, believer in upside-down management, colleagues, not staff, and being a great boss. With that, I welcome him and ask him how it's done. Very well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good evening. Is, is the mic working? Perfect. Okay, right. Um, thank you very much for your very kind introduction. What I thought I'd do is speak for probably about 35, 40 minutes and have some time for some questions um, about two of my hobbies. The first is our family business, and the second is uh, my fascination with prisons. So, uh, and there, is, there is a link, don't worry. Um, so, I'm going to start off just by giving you a bit of background because lots of people think that we have um, a few shops that repair shoes and people don't really understand why we cut keys and things. It really all started with this man here. Uh, my great-great-grandfather, when he was 14 years old, um, he was brought up in a village um, just outside Northampton. And when he was 14, he was sent to Manchester to get a job because he was part of a, um, a silk weaving uh, family and he couldn't really get a job in silk weaving because they used to make flags and apparently the flag business wasn't very good. So he came to Manchester and met up with a cousin and started selling shoelaces on his bicycle around Salford. And he was obviously pretty good at that because he opened up a shoe shop and then opened up another shoe shop all around Manchester. And his son eventually came up to work with him um, in 1895, I think it was. And by then, he'd had about, there were about 25 shops and the business was making money. And it was a time when not just Manchester, but lots of um, the north, northern cities were booming um, and it was easy to grow and make some money. Um, everything was going fine and he decided in 1903 to start repairing shoes. So that's why we started repairing shoes. So he had all the shops around Manchester and then had a horse and cart going backwards and forwards to the shops to pick up the shoes to repair in the factory. That was called RF1, Repair Factory 1 that was. And it's amazing now that we have 1,621 of them, but uh, in, in those days, there, there, there was just the one. And then, then they grew to Liverpool, they went to Sheffield, they went to Leeds. And by, the 19, uh, by 1929, when, my, when the founder died, it was a near, near enough a national business with a massive factory in Kettering making shoes. And they floated the business after he died to pay for death duties. And I think the equivalent today, they were probably making about £50 million profit a year. So it was a big business. But when they floated the business, they managed to keep most of the shares. But by the time the 1970s came around and my grandfather was running the business, and he was the chairman, and his cousin Geoffrey was the managing director. And you may think that's a very sensible way of running a family business. The only problem is they'd never got on. Even when they were kids, apparently, they didn't get on at all. So there was a big boardroom row. My dad was a young director at the time. And um, one side of the family basically ousted grandfather and my dad out of the business and the business was sold and um, it was sold to a company called 
UDS. Now, some of you, I can see, may be old enough to remember UDS. Do you want me to give up on that one and do this one? Yeah, can you switch that? Now? Okay, how do you do that? There we go. <coughs> Press the button. Okay, um, yeah, I need, to, I need to get this one here. So UDS was Richard Shops, um, John Collier, The Window to Watch, apparently. I don't remember any of these. This is what my dad tells me. Um, Older's Department Stores and things like that. So they became part of a group, um, and then that was bought out by Hanson Trust. And my dad, uh, at the time, in 1984, did a management buyout. Now, he didn't have any money, but what we did have was the freeholds of most of the shops that my, my great-grandfather was, was a really good property guy. So we managed to sell most of the freeholds to pay back the bank, and then it became a family business again. So this is, so imagine 1987, um, just before um, the stock market crash, my dad had finally bought the, the, the family business back in, um, but it wasn't going very well. The, the, in those days, uh, shoe retailing was, was changing rapidly. Um, lots of clothing shops were starting to sell shoes. Marks and Spencer's were selling shoes, Top Shop, Top Man, and um, things were going wrong. But fortunately, he managed to sell it to somebody who thought it was, it was going to go well. And so 1987, he sold the shoe shop. So basically, ever since then, we've been a cobbler. We've been shoe repairers. And I joined the business um, when I was 14, so working in our shop in Northwich. I don't know if any of you live um, not too far. In fact, I used to work in Kirby as well, so even closer. That's where I learned. Um, I'm still not brilliant at repairing shoes, but that's where I learned to, to have a go at it anyway. And so... Um, when I left university, I then joined the business full-time, and for the last 15 years, I've been running it. And in that time, we've sort of gone from, I think, I think it was 160 shops when I first started as, I think I was managing director in those days, and uh, we bought a number of our shoe repair competitors, and then we bought um, a business called Max Spielman. You know Max Spielman? Yeah, based in Wallasey, so that's ours. We bought that, I think, eight years ago. And we own a business called Snappy Snaps as well. So it's basically like Max Spielman, but in London and twice as expensive. Yeah. That's sort of how we, how, how, how we think of Snappy Snaps. So where we are now is in lots of ways where they were um, in, a, in the 18, you know, 1870s, 1880s, which we are a private family business. Um, and we're in a fortunate position. We have no debt. We, have, um, no, we don't owe anybody any money. And, uh, you know, it's a very nice, profitable business. But the great thing about having a business like that is it, we, can, we, we can spend money on the things that we really believe in rather than worrying about just spending, things, um, spending money on things to keep going. So I'm going to go through what are the things that I spend my time doing, how I run the business, and what's important to me. And what I've learned over the years, because when I, when I started first working in the shops, I used to work in London, um, every shop I went to, I could double or triple the turnover. Now, as I said before, when I, the skills I learned in Kirby, you know, I could repair the odd shoe, but I wasn't that good. I could cut the odd key. But wherever I went, I could, I could at least double the turnover. Where I could triple the turnover, it was normally because I was putting all the money in the till. Um, it's an easy way of increasing turnover, is making sure the money goes in the till. But because I was a boss's son, because I could break the rules and do, no one would really tell me off, I could do things that took more money. So I could do deals, I could... I could um, um, I, I could order whatever I wanted from the warehouse. and all. So basically run it if, as if it was my own business without any rules and regulations that were in place. So that's why we worked out really quickly that the most important thing we need to do is to make sure that we've got amazing colleagues. We do colleagues, not staff. I'll come on to that la later on. Why, that we just need to have amazing colleagues who are great at serving customers. That is the whole focus of the business. We don't really bother we don't get excited about anything else. All we get excited about is how we can make sure we have these amazing people working in our shops and are really pleased to be there. So to do that, we call our magic dust is important. So, so in loads of businesses, in every organization, there are lots of things you can do to make things better. There are always lots of different strategies from the finance team to the marketing team. Um, and what we try and do is about five or six things really well. And the rest we sort of have a go at, but it's not the most important thing that we do. Because what we've learned is, to, if you try and do everything very well, you will, try and, you will end up complicating the business. So what we try and do is a few things really, really well. So I'm going to go through those now. Um, the first is, we have a very strong culture. We talk about culture a lot, it's very, very important to us, and it's the one asset that we will keep 
spending money on because we know every pound that we spend enhancing our culture, we get back 20-fold. So the culture that we have developed over the years is what we call upside-down management. Now, most organisations have a board of directors that come up with a strategy. They tell the um, sort of senior management what to do, you know, what the most important thing is, and then they tell the people who actually serve customers and put money in the till what to do, and as long as they abide by the rules and regulations, they're going to get paid and everything will be okay. From when I was working in our shop in Cannon Street and various other shops around the country, when I could just do what I wanted, I realised that I didn't want to run a business like that. I didn't want to run a business that was based on rules and processes. Because if you ever ask any of my friends, and especially my wife, I'm not very good at rules. Um, so we, I went to America. I looked at four or five different businesses over there. And then I went, to, I went around some businesses in Scandinavia. And the ones that really inspired me, the ones that I thought really got it and had a, a really strong culture, had, very, had a very similar system to this, which is the most important people in the organization are those that serve customers and put money in the till. Everybody else's job is to help support and guide them. They can't tell them what to do. And the problem with any organization, as it is in mine as well, is that for some reason, when things go wrong, people want to invent rules and processes to stop the odd thing going wrong and the odd idiot being an idiot. And the more people are paid and the, the higher up an organization people go, for some reason, there's something in us that we want to tell people what to do. So I spent my whole life going around the business, finding examples of where this has happened in our organization and stop it. Because what is really important is that those colleagues who serve customers and put money in the till are the kings and queens of our business. And everybody recognizes that. So what does that mean? Well, if you were to join us working in, in one of our shops tomorrow, the first day, customer walks in, there's a complaint. You know, we cut a key, it didn't work, or there was a problem with a watch battery or something like that. You can spend 500 pounds without asking anybody to sort the problem out. So many retailers, when you go in and there's a problem, you have to fill out forms, they have to ring the buzzer, the manager comes over, they think you're some sort of, you know, you're on the take. The whole thing is a dreadful experience. We used to own a business called Sketchly, the dry cleaning business, a bit like Johnson's but down south. And the, the, the business was in, was in, it was, the whole thing was collapsing, it was awful. And they were, they were trying to save money. I mean, they had these ridiculous things, like if you wanted to, a stamp, you had to phone up the office and they posted you one out. And they did these ridiculous things. The whole thing was madness. And one of the other things they did is, is if you had to pay out a refund or compensation, you could do it as long as you paid out of your own pocket. So obviously, you know, the, the, the guys in the shops didn't want to pay out money when it often wasn't their fault. So when we bought the business, I think it was 6.5% of all the turnover was being paid out in compensation when it got back to the office. And we introduced this rule and within six weeks it got down to 0.4%. So it goes to prove if you trust people to make decisions, they will generally make a much better decision than a process will. And it always amazes me with businesses. You know, we employ adults. We employ people who have kids. They go on holiday. They have mortgages. They have cars. They, you know, they do amazing things. Why can't we trust them to make the right decision when it comes to serving customers? So this is just one example. Another is we don't like computers running organizations because we like our colleagues in our shops, to decide how they want to run their business. So we use the example of stock. So a lot of retailers, they have these very expensive EPOS systems that tell every shop what stock they need to have on which day and often what shelf to put it on. We don't bother with any of that. It saves us a fortune. All we do is we, we give our um, colleagues in the shop a, a pen and a piece of paper, and they walk around the shop, and they say, I want 10, pieces, you know, 10, 10 pairs of leather soles, 25 laces, some watch batteries, and they put it in an envelope, and they can have as many stamps as they want. They can buy them themselves. And they post it off the warehouse where they walk around and they put whatever they've asked for in a box and send it to them. So if they get it right, because they know it's their shop, they will take lots of money. And if they get it wrong, they will learn pretty quickly um, and get it right next time. So we, are, we, we, we try and do everything to stop process getting in the way. When it comes to prices, we decided many years ago that price lists should only be a guide. Gone funny. We're very happy to do deals. So basically, the way our prices work is this. You walk into one of our shops, they go, you, you say, could I have a key cut, please? And you say, well, that's six pounds for one, nine pounds for two. What you want to say is, oh, that's a shame. I've only got a fiver. And I guarantee they'll take the fiver. <laughs> I, I worry about the... Well, no, they'll probably do one. They'll probably do a bit of a deal on two for you. But the... Um, 
What's important is that the colleagues in the shops are trusted to decide how much they want to charge. We, all, we, don't, let, we don't want them to charge over that, but we're happy for them to do deals. About 20% of our, our um, customers end up getting a bit of a deal. But the most profitable sale we do is when we do something for free. And we do loads of training about giving things away for free. I don't know whether any of you have been in our shops and they do things for free. Um, we train and train and train. Have any of you been into Pret-a-Manger and been given a free cup of coffee or a free cup of tea? Well, the good news is you did very well getting it free. The, the, the slightly troubling news is the reason, w the reason why they do it is if someone walks in looking a bit miserable and sad, they're trained to give them a free cup of coffee <laughs> or a cup of tea. So it's a similar sort of system. I think they got that, their idea off us, actually. So, again, we are trusting our colleagues to run the business as if it's their own. Lots of people think our shops are franchised. They're not. The only part of our business that's franchised is the Snappy Snaps photo shops in London. But um, they run it as if it's their own business because they're incentivized through a weekly bonus scheme to really go for it. So that's why import, it's really important for them to get as much money in the till as possible. Now, this is a photo of Parish, my fantastic finance director. has been with me for 10 years. Absolutely brilliant. The reason why he's brilliant is he realizes that it's not the finance's job to run the business. It's their job to provide the information that the operations team need um, so they can run the business even better and look after our people even more. And one of my worries with finance, I don't know how many, how many of you are financy type backgrounds? Yeah. Um, one of the problems with an organization, when times are tough, when things go wrong, finance becomes a stronger part of the organization and a much more important part. And you need to be very careful that they don't get in the way of stopping you spending money on the things that are important, which is serving customers as well as you can and looking after your people. So we we spend a huge amount of time on recruitment to our finance team to make sure that the personalities of those working on our finance team is exactly the same as the personalities we want to work in our shops. So, all this seems to be working, you know, so we've got, you've got a bit of a flavor, this is quite entrepreneurial in, in the shops. And then, one of the things we, we, we worked out is that it's too easy to have rules and guidelines. And the problem with guidelines is that no one can really understand what is a guideline and what is a rule. So eventually they all become a rule. So again, I've been around lots of different companies, mostly in Scandinavia, are very good on this. Is we, we did, I worked out what they do really well is they only have hardly any rules. So I decided I'm only going to have two. But if you break our two rules, we get really, really cross. But the rest, do what you like. And our two rules are very simple. You put the money in the till, we still have one colleague a week, probably, who fails to recognize the difference between their money and mine. Um, and the other is, you look the part. And when we say look the part, we mean you turn up on time, you don't smell, you don't have the radio on, you don't eat in front of customers, you don't have your friends in the shop, um, and you don't smoke in the shop. Apart from that, you can do whatever you like. But if you break our two golden rules, we get really cross. And what we, one of the things we found is if you are very, very clear on what is acceptable and what is not, the people in the organization find it a lot easier to, to understand and feel more comfortable working in that kind of environment. So to us, our two rules are really precious to us. And we always make sure that if, anything, if anybody tries to invent a rule or a process, I'm on them straight away. It's not going to happen in my business. Now, one of the things you can do in a culture is you can, you can run it any way you wish, as long as you're really good at it. So there are lots of companies that have different cultures than mine, um, and I would feel like a fish out of water in those cultures, but they're really good at it, and they do it consistently all the way through. Um, and, you know, and commercially, I, I often don't really understand it. I mean, I don't really understand big, big corporate structures, but I remember when Phones for You were doing really well, um, and it was a really hard culture, all about sell, 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 but they were incredibly successful, and that's what they did all day long. For us, our culture works by being incredibly kind and supportive to our colleagues. We, are, we, we talk about it being a family business, being part of the family. Every, you know, we, we mention the word family in a lot of our communication. And as part of that, being part of a family, it means you look after your people. Not in a patronizing way, but in a genuine, caring, sincere way. And so over the years, we've just collected loads of ideas that other companies do or ideas that, that that we've come up with to be a really good company to work for. Now, again, I'm not going to have another go at finance people because actually the, uh, they're some of my best colleagues, but the money that we spend looking after our colleagues is the best money we spend by far. 
We make more money by saying thank you and well done to our colleagues than we do by refitting shops, opening shops, and buying businesses. It's, it's quite hard to quantify, but the last thing I would ever do is stop spending money on our wonderful people. So, I'm going to give you some examples. Everybody gets their birthday off as an extra day off. Um, we do, um, we, there's a new one that's come out now that someone came up with the idea where when your, kid, when your child has their first day at school, you get that as an extra day off. We have 12 holiday homes where you go on a free holiday whenever you want. Um, we do loans, we do dreams come true, we do loads of social things. Basically anything any company can do, apart from having a crash, we don't have a crash, but we do everything else, um, we do and we make sure we do it really, really well. So let me give you an example, dreams come true. Um, we have an unlimited pot where, we, where any colleague can um, ask for their dreams to come true. And when we first launched it, I thought, oh my God, we're going to get some really random ones here. Um, but most of them are to do with um, when people are, when family members are poorly and want to go on holiday or want some support about putting stair lifts in at home. Um, when, when children have had a really tough time sending them to Disneyland, people just having a quick break. We've done, I think, three nose jobs, loads of dental treatment, um, and various sort of things that actually, to, to, when, when people are really, really stuck and they have nowhere else to turn to, we want to be that place um, that they can turn to and, and get help because you know, they've worked incredibly hard for us and, it's, and as a company, uh, I feel you have a real duty to help your people in their time of need. So we're always looking for new things we can do to say thank you and well done to our colleagues. But the most important benefit that they have is their weekly bonus. Everybody in our business earns a bonus and the colleagues in our shops earn a bonus every week based on a very simple formula. Now, I don't know why, it just works. What happens is you add up the wages of everybody working in the shop in a week and you times it by 4.5 and that sets a sales target. Anything over that, they get 15%. And it creates, I mean, I, one of the things that I, I, I'm a big believer in business is you need to understand incentives. You need to understand how incentives can influence behavior. And too many companies have incentives that do not work because they don't pay out. Bonuses and incentives need to pay out regularly. And our bonus scheme has two incentives. One is to go for every week, because our colleagues think week to week. They want to hit the weekly target, so they go for it every week. And the other is they want to do it on as lower wages as possible. So most businesses, when you say, oh, we need to do more, we need, we're going to add in phone repairs or the dry cleaning or the next thing we're going to do, the normal reaction is, yeah, but we're going to need someone else to help us. In our business, it's like, well, can you get rid of them because we're greedy and we want the bonus and we want to go for it. That's why. That's why, in lots of ways, our, when you go into our shops, they're probably a bit too busy um, and, it, and, and you get that buzz and the atmosphere going. But also, they earn really good commission, which is the drug that keeps the whole business going. Now, you can look after your people, you can have very simple rules, you can have a very caring culture, but it doesn't work if you don't fill the business with the right kind of people. So, over the years, what we've learned is CVs are a complete waste of time. I'm sorry to say this in a business school where my son, my eldest son is actually at Lancaster Business School doing, business, doing the business thing at the moment. But for us, a CV has two uses. What's your name and what's your phone number? Because all we're interested in is what is your personality. We can train any of you to repair a watch in a week, to be a pretty good key cutter within a month, and to be a pretty decent shoe repairer in six months. But you can't train someone who hasn't got the right kind of personality to change. We've tried, it doesn't work. So, we have a very simple system of doing interviews. We sit down and talk to anybody who's, who's, who, who wants to apply to us. If anybody wants to fill out an application form, we will give them an interview and it's just a chat. And what we're trying to do is suss out what their personality is. And we want people like this. This is our Mr. Men sheet. We want uh, people who, Mr. Skillful, Mr. Honest, Mr. Keen, um, happy, people who look you in the eye and they've got a bit of a buzz. We know when they are trained up, they will be great and they will get our culture. We don't want this lot. We don't want the scruffy, the slow, the miserable, the moody, the lazy, the weird, the ones that won't look you in the eye um, and the ones that really you wouldn't want to work with because I passionately believe that my wonderful colleagues only want to work with people who are as wonderful as they are. And, I've, and, and, and I, I feel that as a leader of an organization, you have a real moral duty to make sure that your fantastic people only work with like-minded people who are as able as they are. 
Now, the reason why we do colleagues, not staff, is because we don't believe anybody's more important than the other. And when we introduced the word, we actually banned the word staff about eight years ago. And it took about two years for everybody to really get the hang of it. Even, even some of our colleagues, you know, the diehard who've been with us for 40, 50 years, eventually they came around to it. And the, the change in culture by changing some words in an organization can be profound. And I wouldn't underestimate it. It's the cheapest form of marketing you can do, making sure that the language that you use in an organization reflects the culture that you want. So we don't want that, but we do want this. We want a waiting list in every one of our area managers. So an area manager probably has about 40 shops, probably about 80 colleagues. But we always want a waiting list of amazing people, but unfortunately, we won't have a vacancy for them. Because what we learned is if you panic recruit, you'll often get someone who's not good enough because you're a bit desperate and you want to just fill that uh, vacancy. So the way we do it is every area manager has to have a vacancy of three or four fantastic people. So as soon as a, a, a vacancy does come up, we slot them straight in. So we're always sending them emails, newsletters, keeping them warm. Um, so as soon as there is a spot, we get them in. And that, to me, is the, the, the two keys to our recruitment are focusing just on personality and making sure you have a waiting list. The waiting list is becoming increasingly difficult down in the southeast of England at the moment. In fact, I think in some of our areas, we don't even have one at the moment. But sometimes we recruit people whose best is just not good enough for us. And like I was saying that we only want our wonderful people to work with wonderful people, sometimes we need to make sure that, we make th that those who aren't good enough exit the business as fast and as kindly as possible. And the way we do it is we score people out of 10. So we decided we only want people who are 9 or a 10 out of 10 in our business. They're amazing 9s and 10s. They get everything done, they're sparky, they'll go above and beyond the call of duty, they just get it, they work hard, they're great to be with, everybody wants a 9 or a 10. The problem is, is when you don't recruit a 9 or a 10, what, what happens? So you know, if you ever recruit a 1, 2, 3, 4 or 5, everybody can spot those straight away, nightmare, and they normally go pretty quickly. The danger zone is 6, 7 and 8. Because the 6, 7s and 8s, they know the stuff, they turn up, they go through the motions, they are okay, but they're not amazing. And I only want people who are amazing. So we take it as a really positive thing that those people who are less than a, a nine, if they're an eight, we give them an opportunity to improve. And if it doesn't work, I'm afraid they need to go and find their happiness elsewhere. No one ever leaves us. They just go and be happy somewhere else. <laughs> but we take it as a real responsibility of leadership to make sure that those people who need to go, go pretty quickly. Now, so I come on to prisons. Over the years, over the last 15 years, we've been recruiting people from prison to the extent now that we have 460 colleagues who work for us who we first met when they were in prison. We interviewed them, we trained them up, they work for us in, in our shops, in our warehouses, in our office, all parts of the business, and they are um, a normal member, um, member of our team and they are fantastic colleagues. So we're going to talk you through my sort of prison journey and... and, and how we got to it and, and why I think so many more other companies should benefit in the way that we have. So this is Walton Prison just down the road from here. And the first prison I went to was Thorn Cross, which is in Warrington. And when I was a kid, my parents fostered children all my, all, whenever I lived, all my years living at home, my, my parents were foster parents. And my mum used to specialise in looking after babies whose parents were, in, or mums were in prison. So I used to spend hours and hours outside Style Prison, just by Manchester Airport, um, sitting in the car, waiting for my mum to come back out, having done a visit. And we were never allowed in the prison, because I was obviously a child, but I always wondered what went on the other side of the wall. So when I got my chance to go into Thorn Cross, I thought, fine, fantastic, I'm going to go for it and have a wander around, just inquisitive, really. I think those of you, hands up, who, who has been into a prison here? Yeah, the, we always remember our first prison visit, and uh, when, when, when you give most people an opportunity, they always take it. So when I was walking around Thorncross, young lad, 19-year-old Matthew, um, who was in there, he was telling me his story, never been in trouble before, um, got into a fight in Mr. Smith's nightclub in Warrington. Hands up who's been there before. Few, yeah. yeah. Um, and anyway, he got a three-year sentence for um, GBH or ABH, I think it was. Great guy. Oodles of personality. A 10 out of 10. I really liked him. 
So I slipped in my business card and said, listen, when you're out, Matthew, give me a ring and I'll give you a job. Didn't think anything of it. And then about three months later, I got a phone call. It was his mother phoning me up saying, you said you'd give Matthew a job. He's out now. Would you mind taking him on? And he's still with us today. He's still working in our shop in Warrington. He's now married with two kids, great colleague. So I thought, I'll go and get some more. I didn't tell anybody in the business what I was doing. This was before I did Walton. I didn't tell anybody. And I just kept walking around. So I was around Walton, Manchester Prison, so all the ones around here, alt courts and stuff. And I was just literally walking around the wings, meeting prisoners and going, yeah, they're good. I'll have them. Here's my business card. And I got up to about 10. And those 10, I would say five, are absolutely superb. Two just drifted off, it didn't quite work, and three were an absolute nightmare. Because I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just sort of winging it. I, I, didn't, I didn't know how the whole prison system worked, I didn't know how the culture worked, and I didn't know how challenging some people's backgrounds would be, um, because it, it just meant it was just very hard for them to get a job. And I think at one stage I was paying off two people's drug dealers to keep them in work, and you know, sorting out various... You know, I, I even had my mother-in-law looking after someone's dog for six months when he, when, he, when he went back inside. Anyway, I learned that I needed to... If I'm going to do this to scale, I need to get it right. So I ended up telling everybody in the business what I was doing. Um, I called everyone in, all my sort of senior leadership team, a bit like a group similar size to this, and I confessed to what I was doing, and the reaction was something that I wasn't expecting. It was... Fantastic. Go and get me some more. These people you've been, you've been finding are great. They're, they're lovely to work with. Um, customers like them, and they're great at taking money, um, and uh, the sales figures are good, which, as you know, is always the icing on the cake. And also, some of my colleagues, some very senior, said to me, I'm really pleased you said that because you know, when I was younger, I got into trouble with the police. I had a criminal record. I had to lie my application form, and so on and so on. Um, and ever since then, it's been gloves off, and we've really gone for it. So we decided, I remember walking around Liverpool prison before we opened up the academy, thinking the workshops were, were dreadful, uninspirational, poor teaching, people asleep, not, nothing really happening. So I said, right, I'll, I'll open up my own academy to train people in prison so when they're released, they'll be um, ready to go. So there they all are in the Timpson uniform, learning to engraving, shoe repairs, watch repairs. The one thing we learnt, weren't allowed to teach them there was key cutting. But funnily enough, I've opened another training academy down in Kent where we do teach them how to cut keys. Um, and what this did is it firmly put our business in the, on the front line um, of recruiting people from prison and convinced my colleagues that we were serious about it and it wasn't something that James was going to forget about and we can quickly move on. So I, I knew that I had to actually get academies and workshops and boots on the ground to, to make this stick. Um, we had... We learnt over the years of what is our perfect prisoner. And our perfect prisoner is actually someone like Suzanne here, who's doing really well. And she, I think she's been with us about six years now. Um, we, want, we, we probably recruit from about a third of the prison population. So we don't recruit any sex offenders. We don't recruit anybody who's got health problems that will mean working full-time, because we, we will only take on full-time. So work, working for us will not be good for their health. And we don't recruit people who are just not at that stage in their life where they want a job. I want people who've got young children, they're in stable relationships, and they've got parents who will look out for them. So that's why I like to broadly think about a third of the prison population. And we have far more, we have a disproportionate number of women we recruit from prison um, than men. Although there are only uh, 3,500 women in prison, um, that's very happy hunting ground for us. So we've got to the stage now where we have two area managers we recruited from prison. We've got some senior colleagues in our finance team. Um, two have two have done time for fraud, funnily enough. They're the, some of the best colleagues we've got. And just all round our business, to the extent now that I don't even know who we recruited from prison and who, and, and, and who we did. Because we have, a team, we have a team going around prisons all day, every day, looking for talented people, recruiting them in. And it's not as simple as recruiting someone from the job centre, because their needs, especially in the early days, are more complex. So we often meet them at the gate. We take them to their um, hostel, we take them home, we buy them clothes. A lot of people leave prison with 45 quid and nothing. So they don't have you know, toothbrush, toothpaste, duvets, you know, basic things of how you can function and get a job. And for the, so the first three months, we often spend quite a bit of time investing in them and uh, deposits on flats and so on. To the point that they are up and running and leading um, a, really, a much more confident, stable life. And uh, the thing I've learned is the people who we recruit from prison are the most honest, the most loyal, 
and they will stay with us for longer than the people we recruit off the street. So that's why I knew I cracked it when our area managers started to go to prisons to find good new people before they went to the job centre and recruitment fairs because they knew they would get the best ones. So across our whole business, we're recruiting people who have a great personality. We're looking after them and we are determined that we are going to re remain being a private family business because we think our culture works very well being part of a family business where we have a long-term view on things. Um, so for some of you who, li who like numbers, I think the Timson Foundation, which is um, our ex-offender work, and we do loads of stuff on um, adoption. My, my, my dad's into adoption and attachment. So if anyone wants to talk about attachment, I'm very happy to talk about that. I think we, last year we spent 2.2 million on it. Now, there are lots of reasons why people say, oh, what, you know, crikey, you know, why don't you spend the money on something else or take the money out? For us, that is the best money we spend. It's a privilege to be able to spend that kind of money and have a wonderful business like we do to be able to fund it because it makes our business unique, it makes it different and gives it a personality. So when you go into our shops, that personality, we hope, in a small way, is reflected in the way you've been served um, by our colleagues and may maybe you're even slightly happier to give us a bit of money to put in the till. So the future now, I mean, the Timpson business, half of our shops are now in supermarkets. Um, both in the car parks, I don't know whether you've seen any of our pods. Um, the, this is one of my better ideas, the pods. Basically what happened is, uh, I don't know, I don't, I'm going on a bit of a rant here, but I'll just go. The, we used to have a load of shops in Sainsbury's, where at the end of the checkout line, it's about 15 years ago, and they were great, they were making loads of money, but they were big shops. And when Sainsbury's and all the other supermarkets started to go into clothing, homeware, um, CDs and all this sort of stuff, they wanted the space back, so they kicked us out. So you know, we were making like, big money in some of these. So I said, why can't we just open up in the car park or do something? They said, no, 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 no. So I came up with the idea. It was when all these supermarkets were going green. So I, I got a designer in to take a photo of an um, old, sh knackered, rusty shipping container, put a fake wind turbine on, solar panels, and put, put a little Timpson sign on. And we took it to Sainsbury's and said, wouldn't this be great in the car park? And they said, no. So I took it to Tesco's and said, wouldn't this be great in the car park? And they said, yeah, this would be great. Do you mind if our designers just have another little look, just a bit of a play with it? And they came back with a white box. In fact, that first one top left is our one in Warrington, Tesco's, right by the uh, Halliwell Jones Stadium. That was our first ever pod. And now all the supermarkets love them because they all like copying what each other do. So we've got 520 of these pods in supermarkets. And that's been the biggest growth for us um, over the last five or six years. And on the photo side of the business, the thing we, we're worried about is when we bought Max Spearman and Snappy Snaps is how, how can you replicate what is a unique, strong culture in another organization? And we decided, you know, are we going to have it, is it going to be slightly different? How are we going to organize it? And I said, no, we're going to do it exactly the same way. We may have a different name above the fascia, they may do a different thing within the shop, but it's run exactly the same way. So even the paperwork's the same. Everything is the same, the culture, the benefits, the whole lot is the same, apart from they wear different uniform and sell different things. Because as soon as you try and do two things in an organisation, I mean, we are just not good enough to make that work. So we decided, it doesn't matter whether it's our locksmith business or anything that we do, we run it the same way. So, the next time you go into a Timpson shop or a Max Spielman shop, talk to the colleagues, ask them about what they think of, of working in our mad world, um, have a haggle, you should be able to get about a third off. It's a bit of a guideline for you. You can test how good you are at haggling. But the most important thing is to try and see, see if you can feel the culture. To, to, see if, to see if there's a buzz. I don't know how that works. To see if there's a buzz and to make sure that when you're there, they do a really good job, but you understand why they do a really good job. So um, that's my business. That, those are my two hobbies. And I'm very happy to have some questions for about, I don't know, however long you want to go for. 10-15 minutes, okay, great.